So I wanted to start with saying you probably think asphalt. A talk about asphalt is going to be very boring. I'm going to talk about asphalt, and at the end of my talk, I actually hope you disagree with that, and this, this image will no longer be valid. Because when you are hitting a pothole, like Helen was saying, or you start hydroplaning, and you lose control over your car, maybe then you realize, ah, there's something in asphalt, and maybe it's not that boring at all. If we look at the numbers, at this moment, 35,000 people die in Europe every year in traffic-related accidents. 35,000. That's a hundred passenger airplane crashing every day. Uh, the equivalents. Can you imagine the headlines? Now, part of this has to do with actually the quality of the driver, I must admit that. But a large part of this actually has to do with the quality of the asphalt. Now, how is it possible that we live in 2010 and this is still happening? Well, in fact, if you look what the asphalt has to encounter, we have snow, we have rain, we have sunshine, we have continuous oxidation. There's a lot of problems there. In addition to that, there are millions and millions and millions of cars and trucks going over the asphalt. And it has to be able to carry that. But above all, asphalt itself is a very complex material. And not many people realize this. So let me start from the beginning. Asphalt is a composite material. You start with stones, you mix it with something which you call black stuff. This is, in <laughs> fact, the asphalt cement, just like you would have cement in concrete. Now, the stones we get from quarries. And the quarries we find in Germany or Norway or Scotland. And where we get our stones actually has a huge impact on the quality of the asphalt. Because the way the stones polish when the cars go over, or the way the stones stay inside of the asphalt concrete when water starts infiltrating, will mean do we have a stone separating from the asphalt and breaking our window, or we don't have this. So there's a huge uh, important aspect. And every time we build an asphalt, we choose a different quarry and a different type of stone. Now, the asphalt cement has as a base material bitumen. And bitumen is a rest product of the petroleum industry. So when we finish getting all the nice and expensive oil out of this, what's left at the bottom of the pit is, in fact, a very nice and sticky material, which is the bitumen. And the bitumen is very nice for asphalt. Why? Because it glues the stones together, so they don't separate very often. And not only that, what it does, it gives you this damping motion. When you drive over an asphalt pavement, you may have realized it's much more comfortable than a concrete road, right? It's because of the bitumen, which is viscoelastic. To the bitumen, we add sand and other mineral fillers to make it a little bit more stiffer. And we also add sometimes polymers and rubber particles. This depends on the, the, the application of the asphalt and whatever we're trying to achieve at that particular spot. And this is what we call the mastic. The mastic is the asphalt cement. So what do we have? We have the aggregates and we have the mastic. And that's where we start cooking. This we mix at very high temperatures for hot mix asphalt. And what we then say is, ah, one part mastic, 10 parts stones. 20 parts mast uh, stones, one part mastic. So this is where the mix design comes into play. And depending on what we're looking for, this is where we start designing the mix. And the last step of the process is something that you're probably most familiar with. It's when you go out on the road and you see these huge bulldozers and these huge rollers, which I'll go over the asphalt to make this nice, very smooth layer for us. And you have a beautiful, fresh asphalt. Now, we change any of these steps. We go find our material anywhere else. We get our bitumen from Venezuela and not from Kuwait. We get our stones from somewhere else, we make a different recipe, and we end up with a completely different asphalt. So what's important for us is to actually understand the asphalt from the inside out. Now, how can we do this? Well, what do we do, in fact, to get insight from the inside of our body? When we want to know what's going on inside of our body, we go to the hospital, right? We get an x-ray scan, so we see how our lungs are doing. We do the same thing for asphalt. We take the asphalt and we take an x-ray scan of it. This allows us to see what's going on inside of the asphalt. Moreover, it gives us scans, which now we put together, to make a 3D representation of asphalt in the computer. We literally make a virtual asphalt. And this virtual asphalt allows us to now simulate in the computer what's going on in the field, which means we can simulate what happens when it rains and water flows through the asphalt, how does it erode the asphalt. We can simulate how cracks start developing when traffic goes over. We can even simulate when water turns to ice and expands. 
and extra forces happening in the asphalt, which end up in a pothole. Now for this, we need a lot of information for the material, both for the asphalt concrete mix and for the stones and the mastic. So we do a lot of different experiments in the laboratory to find out for different types of bitumen, different types of stones, and how they match together the, pr the parameters we need to model it. We even go as far as taking the bitumen to nuclear reactors, and we make it glow in the dark. And what we do with this, in fact, we get to see how the molecules inside of the bitumen move, and they can rearrange themselves. And they even get to heal the asphalt, just like your skin heals when you get a wound. Now we live in a changing world, and often this is said in a bit of sarcasm, but sometimes it's a good thing. And if what we see happening now in the, in the pavement engineering world is that contractors more and more no longer get to build the road and walk away from it. Well, I build, build it, it's there, fine. Nowadays, what they have to do, they have to build it, and they have to give a guarantee to the government that my road will stay there for 10, 15 years, no problems. And what happens if a crack or a pothole does appear, they have to pay a penalty. Not only that, they have to fix it. So this is a very good development, which means contractors will do a better job. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, well, what the heck, maybe we should just make a perfect mix, right? A wonderful uh, formula. Somehow we choose these stones and this mastic and we make a beautiful mix and we're done. We can't do this. Because sometimes we have to make a road in Saint-Tropez and sometimes in Helsinki or sometimes in Amsterdam. Now what is that? One has a completely different climate from the other, right? The traffic will be completely different. And even from a civil engineering point, the subgrades under the asphalt will be completely different. So whether or not we're building on solid rock, or we're building on a very soupy soil, like, we do soil, like we're doing in the Netherlands, is a completely different asphalt requirement. The way the material should form and the way how stiff it should be is completely different. So now what should the government do? You have contractor A, you have contractor B, C, and they are all saying my pavement will be the best and it's perfect. How should they decide which one to choose? Well, we help them, we develop specialized tests, we make guidelines for optimum material selections, and we use our models to make predictions what's going to happen 10 or 15 years from now with those designs. And then after everything is said and done, science has solved the problem, right? That's what before. Then we have a new problem. We'll be running out of materials. Just like the oil industry is looking for biofuels, we have started looking for bioasphalt. Now, I'm a big fan of biodegradable materials, I don't know about you. If you have a plastic, you use it, you dump it, and instead of having this big pile of garbage for generations to come, it will disintegrate, right? It will disappear, beautiful. Now, if we do the same with the bio-asphalt, we will, in fact, have a problem, right? Because we make a beautiful road, and it will degrade itself, so it will disappear. So next time you want to drive to work, the road is gone. So we still have a lot of work to do on this, and this is something that is a new development that we're starting to work on now, so we don't have a problem 20 years from now, when you're running out of bitumen and we're running out of stones. Now, have I been able to convince you that asphalt is not a boring material? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I certainly hope, at the very least, next time you drive on an asphalt pavement, you just spend a second or two looking down and just have a little bit of tenderness in your heart to think, ah, there's people out there that care about the asphalt. <laughs>